Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Uh, today, we have a very special uh, interview for you. But uh, before we get into it, we want to, I guess, talk about our topic for today, which is homes. Yeah, it's for home. And uh, you found our special guest on Twitter, right? And uh, yeah. So tell us about the guest and what we're going to be talking about with him. Yeah, so I think originally I am. Um, I the project that they're doing um should I like tell people what that project is or are we gonna make it a complete surprise let's make it a surprise why not all right so it's a uh, all right go ahead so okay we'll make it a surprise right. great um so surprise cool. guest who will be talking about something to do with homes is that it something to do with homes that's right okay so we should should we go ahead and get into it then yes let's do it all right cool Hey, Galen. Uh, thanks for agreeing to come on Scorpio Season. Um, yeah, ha- thanks for having me. Uh, I-, I guess I should introduce you a little bit. Um, you're Galen Wolf Polly. You work with um, Urbit out in San-, are you in San Francisco. Yeah, I'm still, I'm the last remaining <laughs> person in San Francisco. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, no, that's actually not true. Uh, uh, but there used to be 18 of us, and now there's like five or something. So yeah, the, the exodus is real. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Um, and so, so as you know, like maybe that's kind of a cool lead in to our theme for today's episode is home. Um, so specifically, I was kind of interested about how the project you work on, Urbit, um, kind of ties into that theme. Um, but maybe to get to start, you can give us some background on what Urbit is for those of our listeners who haven't heard of it before, um, and specifically what your relationship is to the project. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Home is perfect for this because I think that... Yeah, when I was looking this over earlier and thinking about it, the you, it's easy to connect these things, especially in terms of my involvement. So I worked on building conventional software for a long time, mm-hmm. uh, most intensely actually to pay for my education in architecture. Um, yeah. And so I was kind of thinking about, you know, long term, how do people build cities and how to like, what's the physical, how did the physical world come to be? And I was also you know, in the trenches working with the existing software stack. And I felt very deeply that the software stack was extremely frustrating, was never going to provide even like me personally, a sense of home on the network or just even a place that I could use as like a completely permanent archive for my stuff or a way that I could, you know, like a, a, a communications protocol that I actually liked or wanted to rely on. So I found Urbit as a very early prototype in like 2013. Took me a while to get really as deeply as involved as I am now. Uh, And excuse me, sorry. Bless you. (laughs) Uh, No, it's okay. Uh, And so yeah, so I guess then the important part of this question is, well, what the hell is Urbit? So Urbit could be my digital home, is sort of how I came to it. But uh, when I and when I found it, it was you know, what it still is today, which is basically trying to reinvent the personal computer for like a networked world, I guess is like the simplest way to think about it. So a complete software, like virtualized software package that can run on top of any Unix machine with an internet connection. So that includes laptops, phones, but also of course, cloud servers, with the idea being that like, you want to give an individual the ability to run a computer in the cloud that they actually have complete control over. Mm -hmm. Today, we use Urbit for messaging, publishing, link sharing among small groups. So we've Mm -hmm. built some sort of like early interfaces, applications for it uh, to make that platform usable. So it's sort of like Urb is a platform. We want other people to build on top of it. We use it ourselves for a few things today as Urbit has sort of has matured over the years into something that we can use as a company and as like as a broader community. Yeah, the other thing might be interesting on the sort of home front is that another thing that people are really interested in with Urbit uh, as a platform broadly and over the long term is running it on small devices. So being able to run it on, you know, a bunch of Raspberry Pis that either do stuff in your house or control your thermostat or I don't know what, you know, display stuff on your wall. Uh, Urbit's well suited to that because it has its own network protocol. It's a pretty simple computing environment. So it's easy to get a bunch of things, talk to each other and do stuff together. Um, so there's some very literal, you know, like home, like physical home things. Yeah, to me, it's attractive in terms of Urbit being like a potential to be your digital home in a way that, you know, your iOS account or like Apple accounts or your Facebook account, whatever, is never, I don't think, ever going to be. Uh, 
so yeah, I mean, we can kind of go down. There are many rabbit holes to go down uh, with bourbon um, and happy yeah. to go down whichever one is most Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I guess maybe I kind of something that, so like what is like, so if I wanted to run like an Urbit instance or like run Urbit, is that like an operating system? Like what I, can I run it on top? So I run Ubuntu on like my normal desktop for work. Could I run it on my normal desktop or do I almost need yeah. like another computer that just runs Urbit? No, you can run it on your normal desktop. Um, it's just a piece of software you can, I think, oh, okay. I mean, you'll need our, if you want to build it, you know, you'll install our dependencies and build it or you can download mm -hmm. binary and just run it. Um, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so it's not as complicated. For some reason, I thought I needed to like dedicate time to like. Yeah, install we. It. <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day um, where so I have I have some experience working in advertising, uh, but I'm much more interested in building tools, and I think we're just generally, and we I think as a community as a group of people just care so much more about making this thing work than we do about telling people what it is. <laughs> So the amount of times that people have been like, wait a minute, hold on, is it a piece of hardware? And I'm like, ah, yeah, the it can. We're not doing our the best job of explaining what this is. Uh, but yes, it's just software. We have a hosting service now too, so you can actually go to Tlon.io and sign up. Well, you can get on the wait list now, but we're pulling people off that list where we then will run a node for you. So the kind of ideal way to run Urbit is to run it. You run a node in the cloud somewhere you can mm -hmm. issue sort of like children of that node that run on your devices locally, um, yeah. which where you might experiment with it, but you have kind of like one place that's permanently, you know, accessible from anywhere. That's mm -hmm. the way it's designed to work. But yeah, people run them on their Mac laptops or, you know, whatever. Yeah, Ubuntu is a very okay. friendly environment for it. I see. But like the ideal architecture, at least, is that you run it as a cloud node, basically. Um, yeah, there's some, I mean, I don't know how technical you want to get, but you know, nat, it's basically like nat hole punching is complicated. Mm -hmm. So if you're running yeah. it on like a local network, we don't do the best job of that. We do a pretty good job, but it's really meant to run on uh, like in a, you know, permanent always on environment. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I think this is something. So I run Bitcoin nodes. Like I have, yeah. um, so I have some Bitcoin node things. It's kind of a similar, sort of a similar thing in that like you definitely want to run it on your own hardware. Well. Urbis designed like such that, or one of the things I really like about it is that I think, you know, if as Urbit becomes more broadly adopted, most people want the reliability of someone else running it for them. I mean, most people want like a Coinbase like experience, right? And that's what Tlon, so actually, so I run Tlon, the company called Tlon, which is sort of the primary developer of Urbit, which is, you know, owned by lots of people uh, who all, all of whom like own the address space, right? Mm. I don't know how, whether we want to get into that. Basically, to run a node, you need an address. There's a finite number of them. We don't own all the addresses. Um, and so we assume we'll provide the easy on-ramp, but anyone can run the software themselves and should. And there are even other people who provide hosting and do other things on the network. Um, we've been working on some Bitcoin integration stuff, too, because I always think of Urbit as like a really good complement to actual like consensus blockchains um, of any kind, really, but especially Bitcoin. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'm actually, can you like say a little bit more about this address stuff? So like, I feel like one thing I've heard about Urbit is like, there's only like, heard about it in terms of like planets, like there's only so many Urbit yeah. planets and like, you know, kind of like, oh, you can go out and do like a little bit of homesteading, like get an Urbit planet early because there's only so many of them. Like, what's that all about exactly? The, yeah, so, so if you're running a decentralized network, um, mm. One of the most important things, right, is that you need some way to combat spam and and basically like civil attacks. So you want you want like a, someone you've never seen on the network before to have some default non-zero reputation. So a simple way to deal with that is simply just like make the address make addresses finite. And this comes from I feel like the original reason for this is really like if you look at early days of the internet when you had to get with the way you got an inter an account on the you know the early web is that you went to your sysadmin and you were like, hey, please let me, uh, like, please let me get on the network. And if you abuse that address, your sysadmin would take it away because they didn't, there were no real automated tools for dealing with it. No one can really take your urban address away meaningfully, but you do need what's called a sponsor. So there's sort of two mechanisms to prevent the network from being taken over by bots and spammers. One, it's cryptographically finite. 
Like there's just only so many of these things. And the other one is that every address needs a sponsor of some kind. So you need someone to help you do peer discovery. That's all your sponsor does. They don't route your packets. They can't inspect what you're doing. They can't censor you. So we also need a, distribu a distribution mechanism for these addresses, right? You can't just have like a flat set, like how do they get issued? So at the top, we have 256 galaxies. Those galaxies, you can think of them effectively as being pre-mined. They're like originally owned by, you know, core developers. And then most of them given are given away. Let's see, I think I need to have a better short explanation of this, but uh, the, uh, I think at this point, it's like the company owns like 20%. There's a foundation that owns about 20%. And then there's probably like core developers of which there's maybe 50 or more, you know, own, own another like 30% or so. And then there's some, then of course there's like investors and so on that own another, another part. That's like, that is not correct. But in any event, there's about 70 to 80 galaxy holders of 256 possible, right? So it's reasonably distributed. Mm -hmm. Each galaxy issues stars. Do you think of galaxies as like the core root nodes in DNS? Stars are kind of like maybe like ISPs. There's mm -hmm. 65,000 stars. So everything's mm -hmm. base two. It's like two to the eighth, two to the 16th. Stars issue planets. Each star issues 65,000 planets, mm -hmm. making for a total of 4 billion. A planet is like a username. So as an individual user, you need an ISP. As an ISP, you need like a relationship to a, a root node. You can always escape. You can always move if you, if you feel like that relationship isn't working out. <laughs> uh, and yeah, this, I mean, the system is basically just de designed to keep this network like self-governing, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's all decentralized and there's no one in charge, it's like, you know, Gmail can decide or Google can decide who to issue Gmail addresses to and who to ban. Um, in a decentralized mm -hmm. system, you need like mechanics for that. And so the address space is that mechanic. For an ordinary user, it should just be like, you sign up, you get this weird auto-generated username and it's cool and you don't think about this very much. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so there are two ways of look, like looking at it. Um, cool. Their common criticism is that there's only 4 billion planets and there are 8 billion people. We're definitely aware of this fact. Uh, address space design is simple. It's not, um, you know, it's designed to be as simple as possible. It's really easy to extend. So planets actually issue moons. This mm -hmm. is what I was talking about with like, you have a planet in the cloud, you issue moons to your devices. It'd oh, be okay. pretty it'd be pretty easy to actually like let those and right now so moons can't move because you don't want like your fridge like wandering off onto a botnet you know yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it makes a lot yes I, yes please don't go join the botnet like <laughs> exactly fridge moon. Uh, but you could easily just say like oh uh every planet gets one moon that can escape now and now you have eight billion addresses or two and now you have mm. whatever um, i see billion. okay so interesting up, easy to upgrade Kind of sounds a lot like Bitcoin, you know, there's like only 21 million Bitcoin. I think it's million. Yeah. And, you know, there's 8 That's billion right. people. Um, yeah. <laughs> how does that work? I don't know. Well, Bitcoins are easy to fractionalize, so it's like... Uh, so, like, okay, so I'm actually really interested in this, like, so it sounds like, like, home automation is something that you guys are looking at. Because, like, for me, like, something that I think it, there doesn't really exist in, like, the space yet is like a really easily self-controlled like um like i have smart i have smart thermometers is there thermometers the thermostats sorry i have smart thermostats and like i have like I, I, love, I love my garage to be on like a button thing and like i have like fancy little light bulbs that are all kind of all from different companies and like talking to different stuff like how easy is it to switch all that stuff over to urbit like it sounds like you something you guys are like working on um how far away are we from like being able to like, I mean, just like actually move all my stuff over? I wish I could say it was going to be sooner. Um, so the, at a high level, our, you know, our approach is that you want to build a platform where it's really easy if you're a developer to build software that you just kind of like ship to individuals mm -hmm. as it existed in the 90s or basically for, you know, all of computing history before, I don't know, web two. Um, and that should be true for someone, yeah, like running their own devices or whether they're just running cloud software, right? So our, as a, like Talon's primary approach actually, or like the thing we work on the most are mm -hmm. just communication tools that are now in a browser and will live on mobile, just like messaging, publishing, almost like more like consumer oriented stuff. That's where most of our energy goes. 
Um, but so the community has taken this up. This is like one of the things that people in the urban community are the most, are also super excited about and are working on themselves. Um, and they come up with cool stuff pretty regularly and are active on the network itself. So I'd say it's relatively far away for us to say like, hey, here's how you, yeah, like there are urban native devices that you're gonna switch your garage door to, um, unfortunately. But the community that's working on this, that's active on, you know, you can boot an urban and go just join these guys and see what they're working on. Uh, it's pretty cool that I'm, I'm just like genuinely impressed by the stuff that they are shipping and showing off. So someone's like, has a Raspberry Pi with a Bitcoin node that uh, is running in their house somewhere, basically, that you can actually send payments to and from, for example, that was like something that happened yeah. last week. Yeah, they come up with cool stuff all the time. That's pretty, it's pretty great. So other than like, um, so it sounds like, it sounds like people in the community are definitely working on tools to connect like the physical world with the Urbit like operating system or uh, Urbit universe, so to speak. Um, have you guys thought about any more like physical, like virtual permeability, kind of like Second Life or like VR kind of stuff? Like, like what's the relationship between like this like planet infrastructure of Urbit and like that kind of like physical existing? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it is like, and, and so the thing that we are kind of preoccupied with, I guess, is like, if you're a group of friends, a small company, a sort of squad of, or tribe or whatever of any size, you're stuck in this weird world of like, your digital home is, I don't know, Notion, Asana, GitHub, Google Docs, I don't know, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're building with very coarse Legos, you know, they're like really big. They're not, they're just like completely vertically integrated things. So the main thing that we work on is trying to make sort of like modular components that a group can put together to, you know, build a little digital home of their own, where you just put channels that can be of any type, whether it's making, you know, Twitter style posts, messaging, publishing, image sharing, link sharing, whatever. And you can just kind of curate that set of things that you're working on together. So less virtual world, you know, more, just software world. Um, mm. This was always the way we've, you know, Urbit is this starts as this kind of vast, ambitious dream of, well, you could you make a new platform? So the question then we started asking ourselves, well, a million things you can do with this, like, let's start with what do we need? And I think that's where it, for me personally, and I think a lot of other people, it felt like, well, it's almost hard to work on this project without feeling like the place that we work on it is one that we feel like we can curate. And it seemed like other people sort of felt that same frustration that like, where do you build a community that's not totally publicly legible on the internet today? Well, not very many places, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so anyway, that's what landscape is, which is this kind of like the sort of flagship like interface for Urbit that we work on. Hmm. Uh, someone else actually has started working on some of this stuff that you're talking about <laughs> of uh, doing uh, I think the first thing someone was doing is trying to use Urbit as a login for virtual virtual worlds. Okay. There's someone else who is working on some gaming stuff. I mean, there's a bunch of other things certainly that you could do to make, um, yeah, Urbit a more, you know, yeah, either virtually inhabitable. Yeah, it could be a virtually inhabitable place in this, yeah, in the VR sense, it can extend itself into the physical world. Uh, yeah, Urbit as a platform, you know, it's kind of like, it's pretty broad. Okay, cool. Well, I think that's kind of like most of the stuff I had questions about. Um, I did have like, so this is kind of more just for my personal stuff. Like, um, it's like kind of a fun fact that links Urbit to the Bitcoin even more ecosystem is that um, one of my coworkers at work is named Russell O'Connor. He's working on this new programming language called Simplicity, which we're, uh, I think is some people are hoping will become like the next generation of the script language for Bitcoin. So it'll be the new contracting yeah. language. Um, yeah. He actually has this concept of jets that he took from the yeah. programming language called Hoon that um, yeah. y'all use on Urbit. Can you explain what a jet is? So Urbit at the bottom is a single function called NOC. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically 13 opcodes that um, it's just a state transition function. So the way to think about Urbit is basically that it's this little transceiver that receives events and then mm -hmm. computes its new state. It's really not that different from a blockchain. It's just not designed to run as there's no consensus, right? Which means it can be used for personal computing. So one of these opcodes is this is a jet, which basically says, don't run this, don't run this as 
knock run an external function. So run it in whatever the interpreter is, like let the interpreter define the, um, uh, the execution, which basically just means, so knock is designed to be simple. It's not designed to be fast. So for example, it doesn't have decrement. It only has increment. So you have to jet decrement. Um, now that I'm saying this out loud, I'm realizing <laughs> like, did I invert that? I mean, can't remember if it's increment or decrement, but it has a, it lacks like basic primitives in favor of simplicity. Um, so yeah, the jet idea is an interesting and novel idea that I think, I feel like it's one of those, there's a lot of things that are about urban that are strange because it's kind of, you know, uh, emerges from a, you know, DMT trip somewhere or something like that. It just comes from like, outer space basically, which is how I felt when I found it too. And I, I feel like people look at it like, this is crazy. I'm like, yes, it is crazy. Um, but anyway, the jetting, the jetting idea I think is very actually is super practical because it makes it like lets you get this trade off between keeping something extremely simple, which all, you also want to do in the case of Bitcoin, but also mm -hmm. figuring out another way to make it fast. So one of the canonical examples is like, okay, uh, what if you have, what if you want to do, you know, um, machine learning like on a GPU or like even on an ASIC on a specific chip? Well, mm -hmm. you could just say, let's jet this with something that we know runs on specific hardware or runs fast in this interpreter that is optimized to use specific hardware, et cetera. Uh, and we do this, I mean, Irv is full of jets. So we have our interpreter, you know, is basically a, a naive interpreter that can interpret our VM with a whole bunch of jets that optimize specific parts of the system to be fast. Um, hmm. Most of those are written in C code to, to yeah. Yeah, make them as fast as possible. Um, so yeah, the simplicity thing is interesting or yes, yeah, it's replacing Bitcoin script. It's called simplicity, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, right. The cool thing, or I remember when that, that happened a couple of years ago, and we were all very happy to see it because we don't know your colleague, although we'd be happy to talk to him, of course. <laughs> uh, but it was nice to see that, like, um, it was always something anecdotally people were like, oh yeah, well, Herbert's a little crazy, but the Jets thing is a really good idea, and mm. so it was nice to see someone actually just take it, and because it's certainly free for the taking. Um, so I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, I think I have like a, I have a mental image of how it, I think it might work now. Yeah. That sounds yeah, good. That's a start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's funny to hear you talk about like when you first came into Urbit, cause I've definitely poked through the source code specifically cause I was trying to figure out what jets were um, and yeah. came across some strange things like spelling Boolean backward, which is just weird. <laughs> there's some weird, there's some weird yeah. things. That one, there, oh, Urbit's full of strange strange things. Some are, uh, the thing that's really weird about Urbit, it, it's a young system, right? And so there are mm -hmm. things that are weird that are intentionally strange, like they're, they're like intentionally designed a particular way and they're actually probably really good. And then there's some things that are weird that probably just should be changed and they aren't good. <laughs> and it, and for anyone who's just perusing the code base, it's really hard to tell, you know, like, is what, this a good thing or not? What is so with the, yeah, the, the inverse Boolean thing is a, is notoriously like, something that we were like, ah, probably should change that. It's the way Bash <laughs> does it, for example. I can't remember. Yeah, it it's like some people like a conditional to terminate uh, if it's the other way around. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, yeah, so, but ultimately it's just okay. annoying. And yeah, sure, maybe someday we'll have to change it. I mean, it kind of gave it a feeling of like, oh, this is like an art project. This is a, yeah. someone's like little art project that they're just doing like weird, cool stuff. Cause why not? Like sort yeah. of it was kind of the feeling that that particular thing gave me. I was like, okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, like, I mean, and then, like, the second thought was, like, do I have enough time to, like, figure out what's going on? And he was like, no, I don't think I do have enough time to, like, <laughs> yeah. figure out where they're doing with this. Um, yeah, Urban is ultimately designed, I think, to be, Urban is designed to be as simple as possible um, mm -hmm. towards the end of, you know, can, can you make a personal server uh, that's actually usable with the hope that, like, if you keep the code base as simple and compact as possible, which means it actually can be very difficult to enter. It's like very dense. Um, then if you, know, if, you, if you have this incredibly straightforward, but also dense kernel, then you can build simple user interfaces on top of it because that thing is just you know, compact and clear. Um, I see. So, so I, think, I feel like yeah. the, it's like the APIs that matter the most. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like, yeah. can, yes, do, the, do the kernel modules make sense? Can, it, can you interact with it from the outside world in ways that make sense? And we're still even working on that, but that's sort of my, ultimately it's like, I think Urbit should be judged in terms of like what it does, not like, can I make modifications to the kernel? Because like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. 
you don't modify Linux, girl. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, that's a good point. And I think like the fact that I haven't tried downloading it and like running, you know, like, I haven't interacted with it from the user standpoint. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the developer experience can get a lot better, and so could the user experience. But that's sort of like the ultimate goal is just like make those experiences good, like as like platform developer or as like casual user, basically. Cool. Cool. Great. Um, well, I think that's all the questions I had. Is there anything else you wanted to like talk about, or do you have like a new feature or something that we should point people to to go check out? Um, we, yeah, our, the hosting service lives at Talon.io. Welcome to go and sign up on the wait list. I'm happy to do probably show notes for this. I can kind of like create a referral code or something. The hope yeah. with that is it to get groups together. So it's like, we'll create a code of some kind. We can throw it in the show notes. And if you show up out of this group, we can make a Scorpio season group or something and, and get people in all together. Cool. Yeah, that sounds fun. That was Scorpio cool. season home base on, uh, on Urbit. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Great. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thanks again for your time and uh, talk Absolutely. later. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that was a unexpected interview. Like I did not expect a connection between Urbit, the weird distributed operating system thingy and homes. But I guess it kind of makes sense that like a uh, personal server is kind of like a digital home and there's sort of a connection there. So yeah, what were you thinking when you sort of made that connection? I mean, so honestly, the thing, the reason that I um, wanted to talk to Urbit in the first place is I wanted to bug them about uh, automated home stuff, um, which is like a different way of saying homes. But like I, like I'm sure many other people own a lot of like smart home appliances. Uh, well, like I've got like thermostats that are smart and I've got a mm -hmm. bunch of like basically light bulbs at this point. Um, I think most people have like have decided that it's like totally fine to use like Google Home or Alexa or whatever the home kit, the Apple's thing. Yeah, that's it. what I use. We have a couple of Alexa switches for lights basically. Yeah, exactly. And I, like, I don't, I don't have any of those centralized services because I don't like the idea of having it all sent to something I don't control. So it seems like Urbit, since it's like a digital home for your online self might make a easy, um, it seems like a really natural fit for if you're running a server for like all of your digital stuff that all of your home appliances yeah. would have it to talk to. Um, I understand why that's like probably never really going to happen because of the amount of integration you need from all the device manufacturers, but a girl can dream. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a question of like how you draw boundaries, right? Like you can have, as I understand from the interview, the Urbit server does not need to be a physical device in your home. It can be this cryptographically secure thing in the cloud that's still sort of within your boundary, right? Yeah, and you exactly. can make that sort of the staging area for connecting to other services. So it becomes like a clean firewall. Uh, but yeah, I do see a clear sort of connection there. Like uh, another of my friends, Artem, who I think I've mentioned before, he's done his own whole home automation uh, rig and he's done it with like a personal like physical server at home with like lots of disk capacity and stuff and for exactly the same reasons you mentioned he's kind of a little bit paranoid about uh, you know connecting to amazons and googles of the world so yeah i think there's, there's something here i i don't know if urbit is the is it urbit or urbit well urbit i don't know if it's the solution but it's the sort of thing that i think might emerge yeah, I think so. It seems like a good, like, it seems like they're building a good base to build upon. And I think some people in their community have already done a few little things kind of showing off that as a, as an option, which is cool. Um, I actually ran across, so speaking about homes, and uh, I recently ran across this kind of cool project called Frady Cat, which is trying to be kind of like a sort of a, a replacement is like a big RSS reader that like becomes a home for all your Twitter feeds and all of your blog posts mm -hmm. and kind of like, massively collects everything into one feed that you can read. Um, I was watching the promo video for them, which I'll post in the Twitter shout out that I do for this episode. Um, they they really talk about how they want to make Freddy Cat service like your digital home, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, there's something like a personality thing here. Like it's kind of funny that there's people who are suspicious of centralization in the sense of like third party aggregators like Amazon or Google controlling a lot of things together, but they're not equally skeptical of centralizing around themselves as a locus. Like this might be a fox versus hedgehog thing. Like fundamentally my life is not that pulled together that it even makes sense to have it in one place. So I think of my own sort of personal habits as uh, 
sort of wandering between multiple loci of integration. Like I go to Twitter and certain things sort of integrate over there. I go to my, I don't know, email things integrate over there. I go to Slack, Discord, and I kind of prefer it that way. Like I almost don't want to centralize even my own life. I like having lots of little contexts with their own little context cues where I do certain things. Like when I log on to Discord for the Yacht Collective, I'm in that mindset of I'm going to be doing stuff around that community, right? So yeah, I, I don't know, this might be a little bit of a personal taste, but uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of home automation as one of the low side, but not this Freddy cat type idea of everything being aggregated into one locus. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's interesting. There's definitely people who are like, I need, I want one inbox, that all my messages go to, but I think I kind of fall where you do. Like, I don't mind having a hundred different messaging apps. Like it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think the only thing that annoys me is when uh, people aren't sort of attuned to the right context. Like somebody messages me on Twitter for something that I really expect on email, right? Like yeah. if you're sending me a contract to sign, don't send it to me on Twitter. DM. Like that's actually happened to me once. I'm like, yeah, this, this is, like is now the, a professional conversation. Let's move it to email. So I have a paper trail and I have to sign yeah. a document for you. It's kind of like the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion of Twitter. Cambrian explosion of the like context in which you can have conversation in, is also like a similar explosion in terms of like norms, right? So yeah. what you expect on one channel of communication is like, not necessarily shared across everyone talking on all the platforms. Yeah, and even with the, the same person, you might have multiple contexts. Like you and I, I think, interact across two inboxes, right? The message on Signal for coordinating on the show and on Twitter for uh, tossing links at each other, right? Yeah. So, and I have like people with whom I have like three or four contexts in which I interact and they're all like different threads of conversation and that's okay. So long mm-hmm. as things stay in the right lanes, it doesn't get too confusing. Right. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, All right. So that was uh, Urbit. Uh, Urbit and homes. But speaking of homes, yeah, we talk about like home for the holidays. Um, like uh, it is the end of the year, Van Cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you have reindeer antlers. I do have reindeer antlers on. I put on my reindeer. Yeah, I can't antlers. do anything like that, but I can do that for a minute. <laughs> uh, I have ball pens. To um, um, yeah. So. so this is the end of 2020. Uh, are you ending your year with a bang? What are you doing? Do you have any like your end of year like uh, r- rituals that you're going to be? Um... Not really. Like I pretend because other people are always talking about resolutions and things. I kind of like join in like, or pretend to, but I don't actually do any year end reviews or resolution setting except like pretending on Twitter. Mm, uh, okay. But this year, of course, has been like super special. And uh, yesterday I was watching The Mandalorian uh season two and i was tweeting about it and drew austin i think who both of us follow he tweeted something like 2020 began is ending as it began with uh, baby yoda and that uh, struck me as kind of a hilarious uh, comment to make because otherwise it's been such an eventful year it is kind of weird that (laughs) baby yoda is a motif before the pandemic and now towards the end with season two but uh, yeah so my year-end plan is uh watch some of the mandalorian and sort of wind down and uh, otherwise yeah it's not really much going on what about you what are your plans uh, i don't have any solid plans right now i think i have this like tradition of every other year doing a um there's this kind of woman empowerment website called get bullish mm-hmm. um and she puts out like a worksheet to do for the end of the year and i've done i think every other year for the last like four or five years or whatever so I have like three or four of these at this point and they're kind of fun to like update because you get to go look back at what you wrote down that you wanted to accomplish two years ago uh so I, I don't know if this What's is an your hit, or not. like how how good have you been at predicting what you'll do in the next year and actually following through I think on average I'm pretty terrible um yeah. it's but it's fun is. to see like they're really fun as like self arc archive documents like doing self archaeology because i i i don't know about most people but i am really forgetful about what i was like even two weeks ago or what i wanted two weeks ago or what my hopes and dreams were two weeks ago um so like it's kind of fun to be able to go back and be like oh yeah this thing that i still want i wanted then or like wow i can't oh yeah i used to think that was like a thing i wanted like not anymore 
this actually connects to our previous conversation. It's another locus of centralization, time. Like some of us have very fragmented existences in time where it's like easy to forget how you were two years ago and other people put in a lot of effort in sort of integrating their life histories and rolling it all up in sort of a consistent view. Like Artem, the same guy I mentioned, he like logs everything in his life. So he does a personal life logging kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he's got a digital archive to the extent that it happens on a computer. Whereas me, it's like my systems change every couple of years and it's a mess and it's like, there's no backward compatibility. Like I can't do look back more than a couple of years because everything's changed. Yeah. Yeah. I actually huh. like, so I notably logged off of Facebook in 2012. Um, and then last night logged on and scrolled on my feed for the first time in years. And that was like kind of a weird dislocation feeling of like. Alternate timeline. Yeah. Was there a lot of activity there? Like an alt zombie Lisa having interactions with people? No, there was no zombie Lisa, but like, it's crazy. Like everyone else looks like middle aged. Like all my high school mates look middle aged. Like last time I checked in on them was like almost a decade ago. And we were all like fresh faced new college grads or whatever. Um, and there's now everyone has kids and is like, <laughs> like, you know, a lot of my friends are women and their last names have changed. And I'm like, wait, do I know you? Like, oh, right. So it takes like a second <laughs> to figure out who everyone is. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Huh. Uh, so uh, speaking of last year specifically and Scorpio season in particular, so what have been sort of the highlight discussions on the show, if you remember any of them? <laughs> that's like, I mean, that's assuming I remember them. Um, I feel like there's stuff we've talked about that has definitely influenced how I think about things, but I'm having trouble. Like, I feel like part of the way my memory works is I like keep kind of a rolling update, but I don't keep like the granular data. So like, uh, I think my, like, I definitely think that being on this show and having regular conversations has like updated a lot of things about how I see and think about the world, but I can't like go back and like tease them apart really easily. Yeah. I guess that that's why, the alphabet is a good mnemonic, right? Like when I look back and try to remember, I remember we talked about A for astrology, B for Bitcoin. I don't know what C was the first time around, but the second time around we talked about clocks. So uh, there's all these like isolated little highlight things I remember, but um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, uh, I, I mean, I'm the same way about my writing. Like for a long time on Ribbon Farm, I had like a perfect eidetic memory of like everything I'd ever written. So like I was sort of an index of my own writing, but beyond some point when it got to be too much, I realized I'm not actually that good at remembering and some readers were actually remembering what I had written more than I did and they were quoting things back at me. And once I started writing in like three or four different places, all hell, it completely collapsed. And now when people quote something at me and say, hey, you said that, and I'm like, when did I say that? And I think uh, the thing with conversation and audio is that that effect for me at least is like uh, compounded 10x. Like my memory of things I have said or heard in conversation is much poorer than things I've read or written. So yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting. Like uh, I know there's, it's not been like a lot of uh, footprints in the sand kind of like conversations that just vanish. It's not been that. I do think there's been some sort of cumulative effect of having these weekly conversations with you, but I like you, I couldn't put a finger on it. Like I can't say what exactly changed because of uh, these conversations. Hmm. Well, other than facts that we know that you're a cartoonist, um, like a we do. A, uh, you're into cartoons. Oh yeah, cartoons. yes, that was C. The first time around, we talked a lot about C's, and I like a lot of cartoon shows, and all yeah. the fiction I like is also like cartoons. Cartoons, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you're <laughs> cartoon aficionado yeah. is probably a better word of saying that than yeah. Cartoon. <laughs> and one of the ambitions I have for this show, since we do it on video, is learn enough animation that we can do like a 30 second short every episode. But that's yeah. like a reach. I don't know if I can ever learn enough to do that, but one can dream. Yeah. And uh, so sounds like, a... It sounds like you've made a New Year's resolution there, uh, Venkat. Is that <laughs> no. what I'm hearing out of you? Oh. Yeah, this is one of the, those random like, out of the corner of my eye, things I might like to do someday. But uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. All right, cool.
All right. Well, as as always, it's always a pleasure uh, talking to you, Zankat, and uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays, and see you in 2021. See you in 2021. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.